big things in the earth. But he works with us. We work with him. So that's why you're here. To learn how to work with him. And yield yourself greater to him. So are you ready today? Let's get into the word of God. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 46. And we'll start reading with verse 9. Isaiah 46 and verse 9. And we'll quote the scripture and the scriptures will be on the screen. But the greatest thing that you can do is see it with your own eyes. So if you don't have a Bible today, move over and look on with someone else. Or you can read it on the screen. Isaiah 46, verse 9. God says, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east. The man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. So God is endeavoring to show to the prophet his nature. Who he really is. He, he says, I am God and there is none like me. I am God. I am God and there is no, none like me. He says, you can't compare me to anybody else. And then he begins to show the prophet how he operates. And there in verse 10, he says this. He says, I declare the end from the beginning. Now, what does that mean? You need to know because this is how God operates. He's saying that nothing catches me by surprise. He doesn't just see a problem and then react to the problem. He said, I see the end from the beginning. And so here's what God does. He goes to the end before it ever happens. And he declares how it will be. And he finishes it. And then he backs up to the beginning. And he declares how the end will be. And then he begins it. How can he do that? Because he is God. This is how God works. Things happen in him before they ever happen. Think, think about the life and the ministry of Jesus. 
We read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and we see his life and his ministry. And we celebrate Easter next week. The time of Jesus' crucifixion. The time of his resurrection. And Jesus was slain. Two, 2,000 years ago. But the Bible says in the book of Revelation, and in verse 13 and verse 8, it says that Jesus was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. So we think that Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago. But God said, no, Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. Because of the way that God works. Jesus was crucified before he ever got here. Because in God's heart and God's mind it was finished. Jesus was born into a plan that was already finished. He was walking out a plan that God had already finished. Before the world was ever founded, God the Father had this plan. He knew we would need redemption. Before he ever created the world, Jesus was the Lamb of God, slain before the world was. Because this is how God operates. He visits the end. He finishes the end. He backs up to the beginning. And then he declares how it will be. And then he starts it. Let's look at another scripture in the book of Jeremiah. This is what God told the prophet Jeremiah. In chapter 1 and verse 9. He God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. This was the call of God that was on Jeremiah. God knew him before he was in the womb. And God knew you before you were formed in your womb. God called you before you ever got here. In the book of Ephesians in chapter 1, the scripture says that we are predestined in the love of God. It means that our destiny was before we ever got here. You were born into a plan. You have the freedom to choose if you want to go with that, go with, go with that plan. God doesn't force us to do his will. But he offers us his will. He offers us his best. And if we want, we choose his best. Amen. Amen. And so you were born into a plan. Before you were in your mother's womb, God knew you. And he did the same thing with Abraham. In the book of Romans chapter 4, the Bible speaks about Abraham. 
We know the story of Abraham and Sarah. How God had promised them a child. And Abraham was almost a hundred years old. He had never had any children. Sarah was 90 years old and she was barren. She had never had any children. And God comes to them one day and he says, I'm going to give you a child. And Abraham got to the place to where he believed that. And the Bible talks about Abraham and it says he believed God. And it, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And the Bible calls him the father of our faith. And in Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Now stop, now stop right there. Abraham has no children. He's old. He has no descendants to become nations. And God comes to him and says, I have made you a father of many nations. He did not say, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Listen to how God works. He said, Abraham, I have already made you a father of many nations. And look what it says. In the presence of him whom he believed. Verse 17. God who gives life to the dead. How many of you believe that God gives life to the dead? The dead can be raised. A dead body part can come alive. One word from God. He quickens the dead. And he calls those things which do not exist as though they did. If I lived in Armenia and I had a home and in my home I owned a dog and a cat and I walked out on the, the, through the back door of my house and there's my cat laying on the ground but my dog is not here if I want the dog, which animal do I call? I don't call the cat yes, because the cat's katu already katu here. Katu I call the dog. Yes, masum, if I call the cat, every cat in the neighborhood is going to come. And before I know it, I've got cats everywhere. Yes, and if I stand there and keep calling cats, more cats will come. But I don't want the cat, I want the dog. So I call the dog because he's not there. Now that makes sense to our natural minds. Even a child can understand that. And that's the simplicity of how God operates. The Bible says Abraham called those things that be not as though they were. 
So if I've got sickness and disease in my body, and I need God's healing power to heal me, I shouldn't talk about my sickness. That's like calling the cat when the cat's already there. I don't say, oh, I'm so sick. This sickness is hurting me. And I'm taking all this medicine. And I talk to my family about my sickness. And when I get around my friends, I talk about my sickness. That's like calling the cat. The cat's already there. You should call those things that be not as though they are. So I should say, Lord, I call for my healing. Thank you for healing me in Christ. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. I believe I'm healed by the power yes, of God. This is the language of God. This is the way God speaks. He says here that God calls those things that be not as though they were. It seems strange to the natural mind. Because we are not God. But God says this is the way I operate. I declare the end from the beginning. I call those things that be not as though they are. This is God's language. And if you want to walk with God, if you want to operate in the kingdom of God, you have to learn to speak God's language. I don't speak Armenian. I come to Armenia yes, and I'm very limited in what I can do. Yes, when I go to a restaurant, yes, I don't know what to order. Yes, so I need my friends to order for me. Thank God for my friends. Because I could not live in this country unless people who knew the language could help me. And I'm very limited in what I can do. I can't apprehend things. I can't purchase things. I can't go certain places. I'm limited because I don't know the language. And if you don't know God's language, you're limited in the kingdom of God. The Bible says, how can two walk together unless they agree? So we have to learn to speak the language of God. And God's language is the language of faith. And since the creation of man, God has always worked this way. He wants his, he wants his will to be done in the earth. And so God has always used man in bringing his will to pass in the earth. This is this is why we must preach the gospel. This is why we must go into every nation. Because God uses us. And he does not work apart from us. The reason is because when he created man, he gave man dominion and authority. The book of Psalms says the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth has he given to the sons of men. 
We have authority in the earth. And so God works with us. And here's the way that God works with us. He reveals his plan to man. In the Old Testament, he would reveal his plan to a prophet. And the prophet would see the plan of God. And then the prophet would declare the plan of God. Remember, God declares the end from the beginning. So he's doing this through man. He revealed to the prophet his plan. The prophet saw his plan. He declared God's plan. And God could do his will. Now I'm going to read several scriptures to you right now. And I'll read them very fast so you may need to look on the screen. Or write them down and go back and read them later. And there's a theme in every one of these scriptures. And I want you to hear this theme. These scriptures come from the book of Matthew. And they are about how Jesus came to this earth. And everything Jesus did in the earth. Listen to these scriptures. In Matthew 1, verse 22, it says, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, and, and they were there until the death of Herod. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And then in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 2. It says, Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3. It says, For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 14. It says that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Matthew chapter 8 verse 17. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Are you seeing this? In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 17. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 35. Again, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. And then one more in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21 and verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. Do you see what God is saying here? That the bringing the life of Jesus and the ministry to Jesus to pass in the earth. It didn't start that way. That was the beginning of what we can see. But first God revealed his will to a prophet. 
Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the other prophets of the Old Testament. Watch how God works. He would reveal his will to the prophet. The prophet would see what God wanted to do. And he would declare prophetically. And then God would do what he wanted to do later. In the book of Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. It says surely God will do nothing until he, unless he reveals it to his servants the prophets. Why? Because this is the way God works. And here's what I want you to get this today. You are the prophet of your own life. You are the prophet of your own life. God wants to bring his will to pass in your life. How is he going to do it? If you think about your life right now, there are many things that God wants to do in your life. God wants you to be his representative in the earth. He wants you to do the works of Jesus. Jesus himself said that. He said the works that I do shall you do also. Laying hands on the sick. Casting out demons. Getting people saved. Getting people baptized in the Holy Ghost. God will do these things through you. And we see in the word that his will is for us to be healed. God doesn't want us to be sick. Sickness does not represent God. Healing represents God. The scripture tells us by his stripes we were healed. Not by his stripes we will be healed. But by his stripes we were healed. All of these things are God's will for our life. And God wants to do his will in your life. How is he going to do that? You are the prophet of your own life. When God reveals his will to you, it's not just to give you knowledge. It's so that you can see what he wants to do. And when you see God's will, you must speak God's language and declare his will. Declare the end from the beginning. Boldly you should say, this is the will of God for my life and this is the way it's going to be in my life. My life will be powerful for God. God will use me in the earth. God's will will be done through me. I will live in his power. I will live in his strength. I will do the will of God. I will live and not die. I will live, live in the healing power of God. I will live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Darkness will not have dominion over me. I'm going to live in the joy of the Lord. His joy is my strength. Some people say, but brother, I don't feel that way. God did not ask you how you feel. He told you what he wanted. 
na asume in ches du uzum and he expects you to speak his language na kamenu me odunerale zvob khoses he expects you to agree with him na spasume vor pizi du hamadzain vesiren het and say amen to his promises ye vases amen na khos muknerin and declare what his promise is to call those things that might be not as though they are you're the prophet of your own life this is how God's will comes to pass this is how God's will came to pass in this church I came to Armenia over 10 years ago and when I came to this nation I came to this church this church was much smaller this building was not here and not as much was happening good things were happening but something happened when I came to Armenia. Pastor Arthur and Bagrat, they began to show me around the church offices and the church school. And they began to say this. This is what we're going to do in this room. And this is how our television ministry is going to look. And this is how we're going to do. We're going to build another floor on this building. And we're going to expand and grow. And I looked around. And I thought, okay. And the next time I came back, it happened. The new floor was built. The rooms were finished. The church was growing. And then they said, now this is what we're going to do. We're going to build a new church. And they gave me the drawing. And they showed me the architectural video. And they said, this is what God will do in Armenia. And I looked around. And I thought, okay. And the next time I came. They said, come with us. And they came to this property. And they said, this is the property where we will build a church. And I walked over to a very deep hole in the ground. And it was just dirt. There was nothing there. I felt like I was going to fall in the hole. There was no fence around the hole. And they said, this is our new church. And it's going to hold thousands of people. And they showed me the pictures. And they showed me the hole in the ground. And I thought, okay. Shot love. And the fourth time I came to Armenia, I'm standing in the church. The church is finished. I'm standing on the platform. Why? How can that happen? They did not have the money to build the church. But they didn't have to have the money. But what they did have to do is they knew how to speak God's language. They spoke the language of faith. They call those things that be not as though they are. And this week here in Armenia, now they're taking me underground. And they're saying, this will be the cafe. And this will be the children's 
Yerevan'da yere yanmış. Evlerim patmum ey nayna men baneri vur patrasum ey sıranı çeto anelu. And I say amen. Yevies deran amen emasel. God will use us. Yevies dev asvas kokta gortsi. To do His will. Anelu iş kamka. He will bring it to pass. Nada ki ya kanasni. You don't have to have the money. Kalik çuni vur du gumar neri unenas kızbi. But you have to have faith. Bayz du pet ke havat knu nenas. And whatever you need God to do in your life. Yevi çor vur uzum es asvas kok yan kimec katari. The money may not be there. Pogere mi gutse çkan. You may be in pain in your body. Mi gutse tsav ne komar mi mec. The healing may not be there. Bizish kuts. But I promise you this. On the authority of God's word. If you learn to speak God's language. He will bring to pass his will. He will do what he wants to do through you. And in your life and in your family. And with your children. God will do. What he wants to do. When you learn to speak his language. The scripture says your children will be mighty in the earth. Says great shall be the peace of your children. The psalmist says the Lord will bless you. More and more. Avelin, Yev Avelin. You and your children. Do Yev Ko Yere Chanera. But you must speak his language. By the petke Choses Nera Lesvov. You cannot look at your children. Do Chpidi Na Es Ko Yere Chanerin. And say, poor children. Yev Ases Chech Yere Chek. You must look at your children. Do Chpidi Na Es Ko Yere Chanerin. And declare, you are a mighty champion of God. You will be mighty in the earth. 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 You will be mighty In the book of Hebrews, chapter three. I want you to turn there. And while you're turning to that scripture, I want you to think about Joshua. I love the story of Joshua. I only have one daughter. Yes, me and me are chicken. She's fourteen years old. Natasha, you're starting on it. And she will be a champion of God. If I ever had a son, I would want to name him Joshua. Joshua had a spirit of faith about him. He knew how to speak God's language. And God had brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And for 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. Not because it was God's will, but because because they did not know how to speak God's language. But a new generation grew up. Joshua and Caleb. And they sent spies into the land that God promised them. And ten of the spies came back with a bad report. They weren't speaking God's language. They said, we cannot take this land. It's a very difficult land. The land is filled with giants. Obstacles that we cannot overcome. But Joshua and Caleb stood up in the midst of that bad report. And they said, let us go up at once. This, the giants will be bred for us. And they did go into the land of Canaan. They did cross over the Jordan. They were learning how to speak God's language. And they came, they came to their first big obstacle. A city called Jericho. How many of you remember the story of Jericho? 
We know the walls of Jericho fell down. But I want you to notice how it happened. As they came up to these giant walls. Walls so giant that the chariots raced on the top. And a seemingly impossible situation. This is what God said to Joshua. He said, Joshua, see, I've given you this city. Joshua is looking at a wall. He has a great obstacle. But God says to Joshua, Joshua, see. Des. I've given you this city. Joshua had to make a choice. He could either look at a wall and begin to complain about the wall or he could speak God's language. He had to choose to see past the wall to the victory of God on the other side. It's the same thing that has to happen in our life. When we're faced with obstacles, obstacles that contradict what God said, you have a choice. Will you, will you speak God's language? Will you see through the obstacle to the victory of God on the other side? And will you declare what that victory looks like? Calling those things that be not as though they were. Declaring the end from the beginning. The language of faith. The language of God. You have a choice. You're the prophet of your own life. So prophesy. 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 Prophesy what God wants. I'll close with this scripture. Yes, chapter three. I believe God is speaking to us tonight. I believe the word of the Lord for today is. Prophesy, you prophet. Say what God is saying. Speak the language of God. Can you imagine what God is going to do in this nation? I know you have obstacles. But can you imagine what God will do? Through this church. When you choose to speak his language. Join these leaders. And in one accord begin to declare what God will do. In Hebrews chapter 3. Beginning with verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. Christ, Christ Jesus. Christos Jesusin. Now listen to what he says. He said, I want you to consider something. I want you to notice something. Christ Jesus. Christos Jesus. Is the high priest of our confession. Now, now that may not mean much to you. Unless you know what a high priest does. In the Old Testament. They had priests in the temple. And the people would bring an offering. All the people had to do was bring an offering. It was the job of the priest. To take the offering. 
and carry it out to completion. Եվ դա ավարտին հասցն էր։ The high priest would take the offering from the people. Քանապետը վերցնում էր զոհաբերությունները մարդկանց։ Offer it to God. Որը աստուն էր զոհաբերված։ And God's will could be done. Եվ աստո կամքներ տեղի ունենում։ Jesus is your high priest. Հիսուսը քո քանապետն է։ He's not the high priest of your animal sacrifice. Thank God that animal sacrifices are over. Jesus was the final sacrifice. And everything we have today, we have because of what Jesus did. Not because of what we do, but we stand in his name and we pray in his name the name of Jesus and we confess in his name and we take his promises and we, we bring his promises in the form of a confession and do you know what your high priest does? He takes your confession, offers it to the Father. And the Father's will can be done. Jesus is the high priest of our confession. And as you're the prophet of your own life, and as you prophesy, you are confessing to God his will, what he wants to do. You're declaring the end from the beginning. You're calling those things that be not as though they are. But what you cannot see is this. Heaven is working. Angels are working. All of heaven is working. In ways that you cannot see. To bring God's will to pass. We don't have to do the work. That's God's part. Our part is to be the prophet of our own life and the prophet of God in the earth. Declaring the will of God. So I want to ask you this today. What are you saying about your life? What are you saying about your body? What are you saying about your church? What are you saying? It does matter. There's power in your words. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Put God's word in your mouth. Declare it and let God fill you with hope. Hope that tomorrow will be different than today. The devil is after your hope. Through many circumstances, he chips away at our hope. His desire is for us to get to the place where we don't believe that tomorrow can be different than today. Where we just say, this is how it will be. I'm not educated. I don't have this, I don't have that. And I guess this is how life will be. Wake up because he's stealing your hope. 
Put God's word in your mouth. Declare it in the earth. And let God restore hope in you. That tomorrow will be different than today. God will do good things in my life. God is at work in my life. There may be walls in front of me. But I see through the walls. And I see victory on the other side. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. First, how many of you have sickness in your body right now? I know it's a lot of people. I want you to put your hand down and close your eyes. And I want you to see yourself sitting in a room. Just sitting there alone by yourself. And you hear the door open. And a light comes through the door. And through the door comes the Lord Jesus himself. And he walks over to where you're sitting. And he says, my child, by my stripes, I am healed. You were healed. He says, my child, see, by my stripes you were healed. And then you look at Jesus, and with love in his eyes, he turns and he shows you the scars on his back. And he looks back at you again. And he says, see, by my stripes, you were healed. And you feel his love, and the emotions are going through your body, and you begin to see it. A life free from sickness. A life free from disease. You begin to see yourself running and leaping. You begin to see yourself feeling young again. And as you see it, you begin to declare it. You begin to look to the high priest of your confession. Who loves you so much. And you say, Lord Jesus, I am healed. I see it. I declare it. Healing is mine. You healed me. And I am healed. The pain doesn't matter. The pain will change. But I declare that I am healed. Now, right now, where you're seated, I want you to do that. I want you to say this out loud. By the stripes of my Lord Jesus, I receive my healing. I declare that I'm healed. I refuse to look at the circumstance. I refuse to look at the wall of sickness. Right now I'm seeing through it. And this is how it will be in my life. I am healed. I am healed. No more sickness. No more pain. I'm healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for doing miracles right now in people's bodies.
No, right now. Fancy mom. I want you to do something else. Yes, I want you to think about somebody else. Because the love of God does not just is not selfish. The love of God thinks about other people. I want you to think about someone else. And I want you to lay hold of their healing with them. Someone that you know that is going through sickness. And I want you to declare this out loud. I see this person's healing. And I join my faith with theirs. By the stripes of Jesus. This person is healed. They are raised up. God's power is working in them. Driving out disease. Driving out sickness. God's power is filling their bodies. And by the stripes of Jesus they are healed. They will live and not die. They will live and not die. They will live and not die. And, not die. and, not die. and, not die. and declare the works of God. With long life he will satisfy Hallelujah. 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 Come on, give God a shout. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Now before I go, I want to ask you one question. If you died right now, if you breathed your last breath and you were dead, would you go to heaven? I will ask you, how do you know? And there are many people here today. There are people that are members of this church. And these people know going to this church does not make you a Christian. But how do you know that you will go to heaven? Some people say, well, I think I will. But can I tell you something? There is nothing in this Bible that says you can think and be a Christian. Some people say, but I'm a pretty good person. The good outweighs the bad. I've never killed anyone. I've never robbed a bank. I'm not a bad person. But can I tell you something because I love you? There is nothing in this Bible. This says you can do good things or live a good life and go to heaven. Can I tell you something today? There's a lot of good people in hell today. And you might say, well, I'm going to go to heaven because I honor and respect God. And I love the Lord. Can I tell you something today? This may shock some people. But there's nothing in this Bible. This says you can go to heaven because you honor God. Or even because you love God. Let me tell you how you go to heaven. It's a simple story in the New Testament. A man named Nicodemus came to Jesus. And he asked Jesus, What do I have to do to be saved? Here's what the Lord Jesus himself said. Nicodemus, you must be born again. You see, by nature, human beings are dead. Because of sin. Sin is passed down from Adam. 
and we must be born again. You can't do enough good works. You can't serve as an usher. You can't give to the poor and get rid of your sinful condition. You must be born again. Born again means you trade your life of sin for the life of forgiveness that God offers through Jesus. You make Jesus the Lord of your life. Being more being born again means you say, Jesus, I believe what you did when you died on the cross and when you were raised from the dead I believe that alone is the payment for my sin and I received the payment that you made and I made Jesus the Lord of my life I ask every person here today have you done that? I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, if you've never done that, and you want to become a Christian today, I want you to raise your hand and show that to me and all of these people. You say, why do I have to do it in public? Because if you get saved in a closet, so to speak, that's the way you'll live for God. But if you get saved out publicly in front of men, you will live that way for Jesus. God said, if you confess me before men, Jesus said, I will confess you before my Father. And the angels of heaven, and the Bible says when you do that all the angels of heaven will rejoice when one sinner repents so I'm going to ask you to count I'm going to count to three I'm going to ask you to raise your hand one now be bold two by raising your hand, you're saying, I'm making Jesus the Lord of my life for the first time. Three. Put your hand up and make Jesus the Lord of your life. You raise your hand boldly. One, two, three, four, five, five. Six in the balcony. Seven, eight. Good, many people. I'm going to ask you to take one more step. I'm going to ask you to stand up on your feet and let us rejoice with you. If you're making Jesus the Lord of your life, stand up on your feet now. Hallelujah! 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 Will you do one more thing? We want to pray with you. And as we pray with you, the Holy Spirit is going to fill you. You're going to become a Christian. So leave your seat and come right down here at the front. And we will meet you here. Come now. Give them a hand as they're coming. Hallelujah. Amen. Make a do